Well, because the markets have in fact been becoming much, much more dangerous and much, much less useful for decades now. Um, the markets were developed just before the Renaissance and had no, have no ability to understand the, the network capacities of the internet. And so one of the basic problems of the existing design is that it's quite possible for a subset of the market to effectively create a conspiracy. And the cool thing is that they don't even have to conspire with each other to make this happen. Um, just sort of a passion of the crowd can, can sweep up and sort of create riptides in the system that will cause the markets to suddenly boom or suddenly crash. Uh, a very public incidence of this uh, was the Wall Street bets phenomenon where Reddit and, and Twitter sort of accidentally created such a thing among large numbers of retail investors that had gotten on through Robinhood. But mm -hmm. uh, a much more notorious example of this is the global financial crisis and the credit meltdown that resulted because the banks essentially talked themselves into uh, loaning more money to buy an asset that they then decided was worth more money because they'd loaned more money to buy that asset so that they could loan more money <laughs> to buy that asset again. Um, Isn't that and, a fundamental system of government? A, <laughs> well, that's, this, this, is, this is the very serious issue. Um, getting back yeah. to our earlier conversation of what computational math does, computers are really, really good at loop behavior. And they will drive mm -hmm. loops very quickly. So one of the first things you'll run across if you start programming computers is an infinite loop. And welcome back to the Money, the Mindset, and the Mentoring Podcast. Today we have Noah Healy on the show. We were in a, in a this chat a little while ago talking about it. A lot of these things that we're about to chat about. He is a recreational mathematician. Now, most of you are thinking, you know what, I'm going to go out and throw the football out in the field. No, we're going to do some math. And so I'm super excited to have you on the show. Math is one of my passions. When we were chatting about all the things about patents and commodities. Uh, I'm like, dude, I got to get you on the show and we got to be chatting. So thank you very much for joining with me. Well, thanks for having me here, Steve. I'm looking forward to this. Now, one of the things that uh, when we t use the word math, you know, people kind of like some people yawn, some people get excited. Let's talk about the the enthusiasm around math and why people should be excited around math and some of the applications that you kind of put uh, together, you know, using math as a basic fundamental. I mean, obviously, we know there's so many things, but I just want to get people excited around the idea, around the technology that can happen or the systems and processes that can happen out of having a really good, strong focus on math and the analytics that come out of it. Well, I think probably the first and most fundamental thing to understand is that computers are actually the outgrowth of a technique that was developed in order to do mathematical proofs. Um, so if, if you like video games, if you, if your job depends on the existence of the internet, uh, that exists not as an object of mathematical pursuit, but as a side effect of mathematical pursuit. Uh, and, and because of the relationship of computers to that side effect, um, these are math machines. And so increasing your comprehension and ability to, to reason mathematically turns these from just sort of, you know, passive objects in your landscape to tools that you can actually use to, to achieve things. And what kind of got you? If you go back to the inception point for people who are in high school or, or younger listeners, um, what got you excited about math at the beginning? What was that sort of, aha, this is the direction that I want to go? Um, for me, I, I kind of fell into it. Uh, I, was, I was above average in skill at computation, uh, and computation itself is, is one of the things that some people get a kick out of. Uh, I found after being able to multiply, you know, multi-digit numbers in my head uh, or rapidly on paper with a few more digits uh, palled rather quickly. Uh, but 
once I got a job working with computers, I learned entirely new kinds of ways for that sort of intricate computation to occur. And so problems like regular expressions, sorts, searches, uh, those sorts of algorithmic improvements reignited that passion. It's interesting when you say that when I was, and I love math, but I didn't, I never was really good at basic math. And it, I, I, I used to do okay at math until we could have a calculator in the class. And then we could have a calculator in the class. And we're doing like calculus. We're doing finite math. We're doing algebra. And the calculator was just the tool to take care of the basic fundamentals. Then all of a sudden I started to accelerate at math and it became so the passion of mine. When I was in high school, uh, I was on the computer science team and, uh, there was this kid who was basically the best in the state. So he'd win first prize. We'd get second prize and second prize was a scientific calculator. And so I had the scientific calculator. It was pretty sweet. Uh, and then over the summer it got broken. And so the next year I was taking physics and I was like, well, I'm going to get this pretty sweet scientific calculator in a few months. So I'm not going to go buy another calculator just for physics class. And so I had already taken calculus and most of the math was fine, but some of it's trigonometry. Uh, and if you've mm -hmm. taken some calculus, you know that there's some fairly straightforward algebraic approximations of trigonometric identities, assuming you can, you're comfortable with third and fourth, uh, order functions, which I am. So I was, I was solving the trigonometric problems algebraically and, mm. and, and that led to large numbers of marks on my paper of these, you know, cubic and quartic uh, functions with with two or three digits of approximation. In them. So after a few tests, my my teacher sort of pulls me aside and is like, what's up with this like wedding cake, you know, business on the tests? Uh, and I explained that, you know, I, I don't have a calculator, but I'm going to have a calculator. I don't really want to bother getting one. Um, so he actually said, okay, you know, there's, there's a, a sine and cosine, the trigonometric tables in the back of your book, just use the trigonometric yeah. tables. Like it's, I, you know, I know what you're doing. Uh, but it, it wound up, <laughs> somewhat coming in handy because in college, uh, in physics, we had a physics pop quiz. And once again, I had no calculator. Uh, and so I finished the test. Uh, I got done. It was, you know, it was supposed to be a one hour test. I got done in 20 minutes and at sort of study, study hall, you know, the, the, the students were getting together after for homework section and review. And they're like, how did you finish the test that quickly? And I was like, what, what do you mean quickly? I was there for 20 minutes. I, I didn't have my calculator with me. I had to do all these big, you know, cubic approximations to get the signs. And they looked at me like I was an alien. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> it's so funny. And, and now it's interesting when I was looking at some of the math homework that my son brought back, they're very specific about how you follow the exact way to get to the answer. And I know for me, I would always, I was, I would say not like you, because I think you hold a, a higher um, focus on math than I did, but um, I would always, I'd find a way to get to the things because sometimes it might've skipped the class or whatever, but I'd get to the right answer. I just might go on a journey to get there that maybe they wouldn't have taught in class. And that and, was and, actually and an issue for me in sixth and seventh grade, I was taking an an algebra class sort of a grade level ahead. And because I'm very familiar with the properties of numbers, I would generally solve algebraic, the, the algebraic example problems by exam, by noticing properties of numbers. Uh, and you're supposed to just sort of apply these brute force formulas. And, and the mm. teacher ultimately uh, essentially separated me from the class because it was too confusing. They were trying to, to get the, the basic mechanics down. And I, starting from then, I started bringing books into school to read for pleasure during school classes and yep. basically stopped doing homework uh, in exchange for also not participating in class and just, just taking tests. Well, that, and I had the exact same experience. In fact, my principal said, because I'd skip a lot of classes and I'd get in trouble for that. And then I had a, finally had a, I had a math uh, teacher who said, look, as long as you get above 95 on the math test, you can do whatever you want. Just get above 95%. 
And because I'd be sitting in his class and I'd put my head down on the desk and I'd start sleeping because I just, it just, I wasn't, it just wasn't moving at the pace that I wanted it to. And, or I just get the class entirely and go out and play sports or do something that was a little bit more entertaining. And, they, and he's just said, as long as you hit the targets, I'm cool. Right. But you don't, if the second you don't hit the targets, you're in class and you're doing this or else we're going to drop your mark. And that was great for me because then I was finally able to work in the way that I work, not necessarily in the way that the system worked. Yeah, that's that that that's the the hard trick for real life, isn't it? It is, you know. And then if you think about it, because they were able to adapt to the way that you operate. Now let's fast forward to where you are today and some of the things that you're working on. Because you know, out of that baseline, you've been able to then start to really focus and hone in on creating systems, models, and and inver invariably patterns that you're working on around certain systems and specifically around commodities. So if we first start off for people who don't understand the commodity space, we can kind of just give a, a landscape of what commodities really look like and then specifically how they operate today and what you're proposing and how they could operate tomorrow. Sure. So commodities are pretty basic. They are materials that are of uniform quality. So wheat is wheat, corn is corn, cotton is cotton, that kind of thing. Now, this is achieved in basically two ways. Number one, there have to be grading systems that exist that allow people to to meet the marks. Uh, but the, the second part of that is that we then have highly competitive market spaces. So anybody that's ever you know been in a room with an MBA knows that competition is the enemy. Uh, but if you if if you've got like a family farm or or anything else, you're competing with basically everybody else to produce things like copper or oil or something like that. And there is there is a benefit. So the upside of producing commodities uh, is that basically no sales and marketing team. Uh, mm -hmm. if, if you've got a dairy farm, you don't have to convince people to buy your milk. You just have to hit the, hit the production quality numbers, and then you can just sell as much as you can produce. Uh, and, and so those sorts of, those sorts of arrangements occur through marketplaces. And so we have these markets that we've been using for centuries uh, and what they, what they're, existence is predicated on is that when lots and lots of people are doing fairly similar things, then they only need fairly similar deals in order to do those things. Uh, mm. And and so this creates this very high flow. Uh, in this country, I believe the trading flow is somewhere between five and six trillion dollars a year. Um, and the market overheads on that are in the neighborhood of $1 trillion a year. When you say market overheads, describe that word. So uh, if you're talking about farms, which is sort of the, the net most natural one, there's something called the farm gate price. And so that's basically the, the, the number of dollars that the farmer actually gets, uh, you know, across his transom. Then there's, something that doesn't really have a name, but the, whoever's actually taking delivery, there's how big the check they have to write is. Every difference between those two numbers is the transaction cost. Uh, a tiny part of that is transportation and like warehouse fees usually, although there was a scam that jumped those up in the aluminum market a decade or so ago. Um, there's but the large amount of it is uh, just middlemen traders who've managed to work out how to buy risk from both sides. And so they uh, are basically creating a middle between the people that need these products and the people that make these products. Mm. So when we look at the um, benefits and then we look at the challenges, let's let's talk a little bit about why should we think that this needs to be changed? Like if it's been running like this for a while, so what? Like why why would I want to shift the way that things are doing? 
Well, for starters, it's already starting to visibly collapse. Uh, just a few years ago, the beef market had to shut down for several months uh, because it had become so thinly traded that it moved several percent on a single trade. So to put this in context, uh, imagine if the Dow Jones Industrial Average changed by 300 points as a result of the sale of a single share of stock. Um, no. <laughs> yeah. So, so wh why? Well, because the markets have, in fact, been becoming much, much more dangerous and much, much less useful for decades now. Um, the markets were developed just before the Renaissance and had no have no ability to understand the the network capacities of the internet and so one of the basic problems of the existing design is that it's quite possible for a subset of the market to effectively create a conspiracy and the cool thing is that they don't even have to conspire with each other to make this happen um just sort of a passion of the crowd can can sweep up and sort of create riptides in the system that will cause the markets to suddenly boom or suddenly crash. Uh, a very public incidence of this uh, was the Wall Street bets phenomenon where Reddit and, and Twitter sort of accidentally created such a thing among large numbers of retail investors that had gotten on through Robinhood. But mm -hmm. uh, a much more notorious example of this is the global financial crisis and the credit meltdown that resulted because the banks essentially talked themselves into uh, loaning more money to buy an asset that they then decided was worth more money because they'd loaned more money to buy that asset so that they could loan more money to buy that asset again. Um, Isn't that and, a fundamental system of government? A, well, that's, this, this, is, this is the very serious issue. Um, getting back yeah. to our earlier conversation of what computational math does, computers are really, really good at loop behavior. And they will drive mm -hmm. loops very quickly. So one of the first things you'll run across if you start programming computers is an infinite loop. Uh, and there's yep. a number of different kinds of uh, ways that you can crash a system through infinite loops. And, and now that we have these machines that loop infinitely very conveniently, uh, many of our systems have these sorts of errors in them, which wasn't such a big deal when it was people who are kind of, you know, we're slow, we're lazy, eventually we mm -hmm. die of old age. You know, there were all these things that kept these loops from being able to happen fast enough and often enough to actually break our systems. And then we plugged computers that had none of those flaws into them. And so now we're seeing our markets, uh, you know, people reasonably aged human beings alive today have seen the market crash three, four times. Um, while market crashes are certainly not unknown in history, uh, if, if you wanted to do that in, say, 1970, you would have had to have been more than a century old. And if you'd wanted to do that in 1870, you would have had to be more than several centuries old. So the frequency is what you're saying is happening at a at a higher rate. In are we saying the peaks and the values are getting, you know, uh, higher and lower? Uh, well, that's that's the very visible outcome, but it's actually significantly worse than that. So the entire point of the marketplace is that there actually is a baseline human economic interest. We want to eat mm. some amount of corn and beef. We want to wear some amount of wool and cotton. We want to actually build some amount of bricks and, you know, boards. How much? Well, that's what the market's there for, is to, to arrange all those things out, let people know how much gas is actually going to cost, and decide what it is they actually want to do under those constraints. Uh, and so as that information becomes less and less reliable and more and more expensive, we wind up going off on boondoggles and investing in things that really don't have any kind of a future. Uh, and that's basically the world that we are presently living in, where the markets are telling us that, 
you know, this company is ridiculously valuable um, just because maybe some some kids on Twitch who are live streaming themselves day trading decided it. Or maybe because, you know, Boeing, for example, still has a high stock price in spite of the fact that, uh, you know, one of their engines just self-peeled uh, during flight. So it, the the market's connection to actual reality is becoming more and more tenuous, and that's showing up as these these sort of spikes and 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 valleys. But the the deeper cause is that with our ability to shove machines in, human input is actually being removed from the marketplace, and and so once it starts telling us, you know, if you got Stephen King to to write what the market says, it might be a lot more engaging, but you wouldn't necessarily want to live there. <laughs> yeah, that's right. No dead pets. Um, the, it's interesting when you, when you, when you talk about adding the machines, because I know there's some people when they go to markets, they, people always, they'll, they'll say, well, what are the big guys doing? And we'll just follow whatever their trades are. And, and, and then if you set up at a machine that says uh, programmatically, we're just going to follow what the big guys do. And, and and so that then is again one of those systems and models that's a, a you know destined to create problems because now it's not based on fundamentals it's just based on popularity. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, and uh, that that means that means that uh, we're spending more and more for a product that's worth less and less. And and again, that's a that's a bad loop to be in. And we have these machines that do loops very, very quickly. So that's that's the kind of disaster that we're looking at. Yeah, in the the idea of the machine doing a loop. I mean, we've all written that Excel, you know, one thing that just does a loop and crashes or, or wrote a program and it just all of a sudden spirals out of control, especially when you start throwing large language models and, you know, all this new AI stuff at it. You know, it it's going to start going through all of these loops. And we played with enough with AI to know AI works until it doesn't. And then it gets into this really bad loop of making bad decisions. And whether that's in a GPT that you've created or whether that's in a some sort of system model that you put out, what do you think that AI is going to do as it gets thrown into the, the mire of all of this? I mean, it, it certainly it's well, already there. Well, I've told people in many cases, you have the wrong tense. So actually, uh, BlackRock has been using an AI system called Aladdin for close to two decades now. Uh, mm. There's another uh, group called Renaissance Technologies, and they're not mm -hmm. that forthcoming about what they do, but they've been reliably beating the marketplace for well over a quarter of a century um, at this point. And what they claim to have been doing is uh, building effectively self-reliant AI models to just go out and trade their their own money for them uh and that's what they that's what they say they've been doing for for decades now so in the exact time period that i'm talking about where we've seen markets become less stable and more expensive uh we have we've had ai technology that isn't producing, you know, palindromes and and witticisms and stuff, but is actually producing market actionable strategies and executing them. That's exactly what's been happening. So, to the benefit of the uh, individual, for sure, in the basis of profits, but to the market itself, you know, driving a spiral of of demise is what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. Um, people like Larry Fink and I can't remember the guy's name that runs Renaissance, uh, but he's he's usually billed as the world's smartest billionaire. He's got a Fields Medal, um, mm. and uh, uh, yeah, they're doing very very well um, out of a system that is broken. So we've sort of painted a bleak landscape, and and. I'm, I have a sign behind me that says no negativity allowed. So uh, I have to subscribe to the sign that I have. Um, how do we fix this? Like, what is, what, is the, what is the way to get out of the problem that we're in? Well, I call them coordinated discovery markets. And speaking of generative uh, AI, you can actually ask ChatGPT what a coordinated discovery market is or Claude or any of the rest of them because I've been doing this for long enough that they'll explain what I'm explaining. Uh, but the marketplace... If we break it down again, what the marketplace is about is 
finding consensus information and communicating consensus information. And the problem with that is basically noise. Everybody's got an opinion. People's opinions are partially right. Some people's opinions are more partially right than others. Uh, but, but how do we sort of gather up all the actual human interests and carve out a path of where prices actually are and where they're actually going? And so that's what I did. I found a way to change the structure of the market from a two-player buyer-seller game to a three-player producer-consumer negotiator game. And by setting it up that way, right now the market works in tension where uh, both sides are essentially in a tug of war. And the idea is that since both sides are going to be roughly equally strong, that that the center of that rope is going to wind up about where it's supposed to be. Computers broke that balance and basically, you know, there's like a, a world strong, a world strong man or like a heavyweight lifting champion out on the playground with the kids now. And he just rips people off their feet <laughs> into the mud. And then he goes over and gets another kid and rips them off the feet into the mud too. Um, so what I've done is created this three player game where effectively everybody's against the world. So when the market goes wrong, everybody loses money. And when the market goes right, everybody makes money. So I, I want to I play that. That's a very interesting way of looking at the supply and demand curve, because that's one thing I've never really thought about is you think about the buyer and the seller and the buyer and the seller by virtue of a large group of buyers and a large group of sellers that invariably you meet this, this, this connection point of what the true value of whatever something is, something's willing, what something's worth, what somebody's willing to pay. But what you're saying is that doesn't take into context the, the, the skill or the strength of the buyer or the skill or the strength of the seller. And if it's disproportionately put in the, the hands of one group, then that whole supply and demand curve kind of goes to pot. Is that what you're saying? Uh, effectively. So if you think about sort of the classic, you know, supply demand curve, you basically got an X, right? And we always are taught it and think about it in terms of that crossing point, but we never actually get mm -hmm. to that crossing point. We have middlemen, we've got traders, we've got experienced people. And so what happens is you're sort of climbing up that hill towards that crossing point. And at some point below that crossing point, you hit your, your culture's efficiency level. And what mm -hmm. happens is you get the buyers sort of get up to as high as they can get, and there's a little plateau up there. And that's where the traders, the traders run back and forth across that plateau. And what computers basically did is let them dynamite the plateau down and widen out those buyers and sellers. And so mm -hmm. the reason why we've been able to up like land productivity by a factor of 10. And that's not just in agriculture. You know, we have new chemical techniques that allow people to go back to, to tailings from previous mines and remine the tailings because there's just so much crap that's still in there that we can pull out with our now stronger acids and things like that. Um, mm. We become radically more productive at the same time that the people doing that production have, be have lowered their profit margins. Uh, so how does, you know, you get 10 times better at your work. Now you're, now you're on welfare. Like, how does that work? Yeah, um, exactly. It works because the, the middlemen didn't get 10 times better. They got hundreds and hundreds of thousands of times better. Computers are getting a thousand times more powerful, you know, every 15 years. And that that productivity is being focused and concentrated in uh, the command control and intelligence portions of our society. And so they're basically sucking up a larger and larger portion, but just, you know, live by the sword, die by the sword, live by the algorithm, die by the algorithm. We can reconceive yeah. these systems algorithmically to make production valuable again and then we'll become you know we already have the tools to be productive we can just create the incentives to get people to apply that so i, I kind of see what you're saying so when we look at the sub supply and demand curve we always talk about that x but it's really not about the x it's about the tails and the end of those x's or where the, su the supplier right the, it's, about, the... it's about how close to that x you can actually get 
because yeah, there's there's two different interests, right? The closer yeah. you get to that X, the richer your society gets. But the further yeah. you get away from that X, the more the middlemen make. So yeah. then yeah. sudden and so now does your society have a way to to create a tension with middlemen? Well, look at our society. It doesn't really look like we have one of those. Uh but again Absolutely. I mean when we look at any yeah. of the other even if we look at other industries outside of commodities, and we see the middlemen are, are sort of dominating this, the, the markets, the administrator class. The administrator class comes into a – like when you look at construction, you've got all of these different administrator class organizations that are – they call themselves governing bodies for the perspective of the benefit of the construction person. But invariably, they just start getting fat. And they just start making a lot of money off of the construction company. And invariably, they're making less and less as the producer. So that administrator class comes in, just like you talk about the middleman comes in and starts eating away at every, all the value that's being created by the producing class. So is, is that sort of summary of what you're that's, saying? That's absolutely what we've seen multiplied across yeah. every, every different industry. Uber has no intention to ever make cars. Uh, or, or, you know, build taxi companies, their long-term plan is for other people to solve the problem of self-guided vehicles and for them to become the sole portal to transportation on planet Earth, uh, yep. which is insane and evil, <laughs> frankly. <laughs> Oh, I mean, anybody who comes over and dominates a whole space, you, you got to wonder the, the ethics around that. And I mean, domination is great. I mean, if I were the world champion of boxing, I mean, I'm not going to feel bad about it. Uh, I'm going to feel good about that. So, I mean, there's a certain amount of competition. Healthy competition is good. I think the word unhealthy competition, I think there's, there's a problem with that. Well, as well a, as unhealthy administration. There, yes. There's a very real difference between winner take all competitions and, and, sort of evolutionary competitions where there's sort of a bar and you break the bar and everything's cool and you're below the bar and everything's not cool. Um, our society has become very, very focused on winner take all competitions, which for like boxing is pretty valuable. It would sort of suck mm -hmm. if there were thousands and thousands of people who beat people up for a living and were really, really good at it. Like that, that, we're we're way better off in a world where we keep that that kind of situation very focused and sure mm -hmm. we make a few millionaires but who cares that's a rounding error um yep but turning everything into a winner take all competition it might be nice to to have the single best taxi driver in human history and i i think i might have had him in in beijing once but People need jobs, and and if it's mm. impossible to be employed unless you're Michael Jordan, um, then nobody's going to be employed anymore. <laughs> well, that that's the, obviously the biggest fear as we go forward. But I, that's a whole another conversation. I'd love to have you chat with you on that one. But to to focus a little bit more on you talked about, there's the buyer, the seller, and then there's the negotiator. How do we turn the word negotiator not into the administrator? And you said. The buyer well, so and seller there's, instead there's of against actually, each other. Right. Yeah. So there's actually an operator um, and they're the administrator. And th in my case, the operator is a computer system that's completely open source mm. that works by simply auditing the entire system of what everybody's doing. And because of the way it's designed, they effectively can make all decisions arbitrarily. So you need you need a human being to legally hold the bag. Um, but the computer actually does the, the, the actual work and the computer does the work by not caring at all. So all the sort of cronyism and corruption that's implicit in ordinary administration goes bye bye because the human being that's holding the bag for the computer program is basically on the hook for not being a crony and not interfering with the verifiable computer program. So anybody that wants to check whether or not he's doing what he's supposed to do can simply read the inputs that are coming in and the code, which is all public information, and reproduce and see that they came up with the same answer he's coming up with. So because the code is public, 
it means that it's not, it doesn't have that inherent flaw of having a private code or a government regulated code where it becomes more of an instrument of control rather than an instrument of, of exchange. Absolutely. Yeah. That's a, that's a pretty serious flaw in our modern security thinking. Um, in a human administration system, privacy is extremely important because uh, you don't want undue pressure brought on the regulators, but that, of course, has its own problem with corruption of, of the administration and regulation. Uh, but for computers, it's the exact opposite of that. Because they're machines, we need to be able to examine them to determine whether or not they're designed and operating properly. Yeah, whether or not they have a predisposition to some sort of behavior pattern that, you know, inadvertently or inadvertently benefits a specific receiver. Absolutely. So if the code's public, and, and again, I'm not a tech uh, uh, professional, does that make it more safe or does that make it more apt to having hackers and that sort of thing when, when people uh, know the code? Much more safe. So two quick tales of recent history. Uh, there was an attempt to upload, which actually got into a sort of alpha version of the Linux code base a some of you know is a privilege escalation so basically some some people uh went in joined the open source community wrote a hole in the back end of the system submitted the hole and got it accepted but before it actually got to the, anywhere where it would be published um it was detected that this was happening and and it it got cr canceled out and it's not going to happen a little, a little bit before then, it was uh, discovered rather accidentally, or published rather accidentally, that Apple um, had actually acceded to a hardware uh, backend being placed into their products by the U.S. government. Uh, that hardware backend has no possibility of of a software fix. Um, it's just a permanent open problem that every Apple device, uh, at least in the last, you know, several decades, uh, has and will continue to have uh, forever. And whoever in the government has the keys, plus anyone else who has access to those keys by whatever mechanism, can use that, that backdoor into Apple products. And it's not terribly unlikely that similar backdoors exist in other closed door, you know, closed form products as well. Interesting. So what you're saying is where people perceive Apple as having a very strong gate, there's a, a built in, uh, built into the DNA of the hardware backdoor that a government has the access to, to key into. That's yeah. That story came out about a month ago. Wow. Does it in the same thing exist on the, the Microsoft side as well? Or uh, so Microsoft is somewhat more hardware agnostic. It would I would judge it unlikely that the U.S. government had not leaned on Microsoft from for a software perspective at some point. Microsoft was instrumental in something called the Trusted Computing Program, uh, which is at the very least on all laptops, and which unless you disable it, which you can't do with Microsoft products. Um, you, your laptop has not, strictly speaking, a backdoor, but a privilege mode that you, as the owner of the machine, have no access to, but uh, media companies have access to, so that they can detect whether or not you're attempting to use your machine to do things with their content that they would deem undesirable, uh, like do anything other than looking at it. Interesting. Interesting. So then how do you avoid all of that? If you wanted to have ultimate privacy, or is that something that just doesn't exist in today's world? Uh, well, you know, if you own a home, uh, you could install a Faraday cage and sleep inside <laughs> of it. <laughs> <laughs> so we got to get our metal hats on and we, we'll be, uh, we'll Part of, part of our fundamental problem in this day and age is to establish a form of society that works with the technology that we have. Uh, one point that I like to make to people who feel that this privacy invasion is way too much and way too far, which I totally agree with, is that 
most of the human beings that have lived in the historical period lived in villages where the average degree of privacy experienced by an individual was even lower than somebody that's you know currently being scoped out by the FBI, the NSA, Google, and Facebook. Um, you know, in a, if, if you're living in a village with a few hundred people, not only does everybody know where you are and what you're doing all day, every day, but they know, you know, everything else about you too. Uh, and so that's true. Yeah. So it's, it's not impossible for human beings to have some sort of living accommodation that functions with some of these sorts of, of, what would appear to be impositions, uh, but our society isn't currently built around the assumption of those of that existing. And so some of the things that we've seen with the radical increase in mental illness of, among teenagers and young people uh, and, and the financial difficulties for most of the citizens in developed countries uh, uh, leading to uh, demographic collapse. These things are all symptoms of the fact that the societies that we've built were built by people who, you know, basically were just inventing cars and had railroads and stuff like that. And we have much, much more powerful machines that are completely ubiquitous and we're going to need a much, much more powerful societies uh, that that can wield that power in ways that are helpful to the society, not simply helpful to the people who happen to be on top of the present societies. Yeah, and I think that goes down to the idea that, you know, fire makes a really good slave. It makes a terrible master. And I think when we look at technology, technology sits in that same caliber right, right now you know, many people would perceive technology is nearing master because of the, just the pervasive nature that it has within society. The, the fact that most people, if, if all the computers shut down, would not be able to function. They can't grow their own food. They can't connect to their ecosystem of the people that they know. Uh, they're going to remain disconnected and try to figure out how they can solve life moving forward. And so really technology has taken that, that, that master role in, in inadvertently or by, by design. Uh I'm not I'm sympathetic to that point of view. I think that to some extent that is a point of view being promulgated by the people who are actually in charge. So I see people as still having the master role. And I think that much as kings and queens didn't have much of a future once the model of combat shifted from knights on, on horseback to tanks, um, I think that you know, CEOs and, and presidents um, won't have much of a role in a functioning society when when the process of communicating across continental distances and coordinating meetups among hundreds of people is is once again a goes from having some guy who's tall and shouts loud uh, versus versus the ability to create viral content. And, and a lot of people will say that the democratization of communication through things like social media and the fact that, you know, Joe down the street could have as much uh, clout as, you know, somebody who is being propagated by, you know, public media, um, as much as that is somewhat true, the baseline system, the operating system that's, uh, that's, that's propagating those messages is still has a master and that master would be that CEO of that company. And so, therefore, they're still the one who's in control of the domain of play. You know, uh, I I would view that as a temporary circumstance at at best. Interesting. Tell me more on that. Uh, well, we're already seeing uh, the job of being CEO becoming more and more difficult, uh, and and the the technology that we're developing around AI is actually ideally suited to replacing the jobs at the top of our society. Now, for social and cultural reasons, we are focusing our efforts on replacing bottom of our society jobs. But if you build an AI robot that can be a garbage man or drive a truck, then it will have already had the capacity to run a Fortune 500 company 
better than the current management can. Um, and that is a really – so here's the question. When do you think the first AI CEO will come out? Well, uh, I would like a model something like mine to to be that that thing. So my system is not an AI in the – in the sense that it's generally being pushed out. My, my system is a super intelligence alignment algorithm. So it's essentially a mechanism where human and artificial intelligences can join together to create better decision-making. Um, so that would be, that'd be fantastic. Uh, but if it, if it doesn't go that way, um, I, I guess that some of these, uh, more troubled companies, uh, Companies like Boeing and Disney and, you know, think about think about sort of old school blue chips that are very publicly failing. Uh, Budweiser, uh, as, as it becomes more and more obvious that uh, these these institutions are incompetent or criminal or both um, uh, pressures will mount to to get rid of people. And eventually there won't be people to replace those people like you know who's gonna who's gonna sign up to defend something that's completely publicly discredited so if you if you said for example and let's just look at disney for a moment and say you're going to take the the board of directors and replace them with ai or take the ceo and replace them with ai or bring in an ai third-party consultant to to help them Re, re landscape the organization based on some fundamentals. It just goes down to who's writing those fundamentals of, of what the new business model needs to work like. And is that being written through AI? Is that being written by an individual? Well, so that's actually a general, uh, this is another one of my old aphorisms. Um, if your company buys software, then every decision made about how your company runs by the people that wrote that software is how your company runs. Um, and that's true for your spreadsheet software or, or if you've got an AI coach, executive coach in somehow. Um, mm -hmm. that's just, that's just a basic fact that most people do not seem to be aware of. Uh, in general, uh, I would expect the form of the job to change unrecognizably. So the example I generally use is that modern tractors don't actually work the same way that, say, uh, 17th century plows work because when you have access to the amount of power that uh, a diesel engine gives you, it no longer makes sense to design your plowshare in the same way. You can get better kinds of outcomes by doing this more powerful thing. Uh, and so mm -hmm. the existing executive roles are in many cases predicated on the human limitations that are intrinsic. And so I would say that an AI-ifying organization would re-architect itself around the concept of information and and the dividing line of information would be signal and noise. And so mm. they would need to sit down and essentially make decisions about what what the dividing line of signal and noise was for their organization and create routed feedbacks from those things to whatever was actually going on in in their system um and so there something like a uh, netflix which had a handful of analytics based uh uh home runs uh before they just started deciding to throw money at everybody uh because mm -hmm. their business model said that they could uh you know they they didn't actually have to account for their failures anymore but um but that that sort of re rearchitecting and reorganizing around information instead of individuals um is the sort of thing that happens and then allows you to exploit what computers are good at, which is remembering things very clearly and rapidly, and again doing you know very tight loops very quickly, uh, and so uh, micro transactions, very very small things that you can add up a whole bunch of, uh, and and 
humans would still be involved, but the sorts of executive power that presently exists would be distributed across an organization that was more complicated because it had access to computer processing of the inputs and outputs of that organization. So if we, if we step that up a notch and look at governments rather than corporations, and you look at the voted in parties that, that come in and they all make decisions based on constituencies and, or whatever, you know, party tells them to do uh, if they're party solidarity. But the idea is, could this same model then propagate into how governments run? And, Absolutely. And I, I would expect governments run on our lines just as governments that were run on uh, previous age lines, you know, there aren't a lot of divine right kings operating on Earth today. There are a few, and the ones that exist endorsed by their own fiat, basically the Bill of Rights of the United States of America, because it turns out that that's more or less the the legal environment that human beings living in an industrial society need to be able to thrive economically and personally. But we don't know what the legal environment required of people to thrive in a computational environment. There's only a few dozen thrivers right now, and, and they're not generalizable. Everybody can't be Jeff Bezos. So that's that the hard process that's in front of us is working out what sort of modus vivendi uh, actually would exist. One interesting idea is that uh, juries are significantly easier to pull together in an environment where lots of people are online uh, and secure communications links exist. And so we could actually see vastly greater jurification of decision-making uh, and less mm. requirement for representation uh, as a, as a consequence. Um, yeah. Now, if, so again, it goes down to the people who show up for jury are, you know, a different body than the people who don't. And, and, and I'm not saying like, I, I'm not an American, so I don't know the jurors jury part process down in the States of, of how that works. But, you know, for me, I would look and say, I would prefer not to be on a jury where possible because I have another objectives to achieve in my life. But are you saying these are people who are, they're being chosen to be on this jury by random selection or are these people who are choosing to be on the jury and how would that be anything different than somebody who's just choosing to be a, a politician? Well, that's, again, this is the challenge. Like we have no actual examples of working societies that have computers. We have societies that have computers and those societies have terrible reproduction rates, massive, uh, you know, unemployment problems, serious mental health issues, declining life expectancies. So those don't work. Uh, we have other societies that, that are growing, um, but they live in the stone age. Um, maybe that's as good as we can do as human beings. I don't think that's the case, but nobody knows. So the problem is to actually work through the, the problem, which is how do we make societies that are made out of people that are economically productive, mentally healthy, mentally and physically healthy, and, and also, you know, biologically procreative so that there's still a society in a generation. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and we very obviously don't have a solution to that problem. Uh, what I have is a suggestion for how to produce a, an economic baseline. So it's actually interesting because then what basically what you're saying is, and, and hopefully I'm getting this right. What you're saying is, or alluding to is that it's not a left problem. It's not a right problem. It's potentially not even an economic problem or a social problem. The one thing that we have not been able to reconcile in the past 30 years is it's a technology problem and the impact of what that's doing to our society. It, it, I would actually argue that it's even deeper than that. It's actually a math problem. So what Alan Turing did when he 
incidentally invented the computer so he could prove something he was really interested in was he disproved the fundamental assumption of the Enlightenment. Um, the Enlightenment politically built out on the assumption that it would be possible to base your society in reason because reason had all of the properties that God had offered the the divine right monarchies. It was this external, eternal, true thing. And what Alan Turing did was demonstrate that it wasn't omnipotent and that its entire content, well, some other people had to point this out eventually, but they did within a few decades, its entire content was simply whatever its premises happened to be. And so the the justification for the kinds of governments we have and the kind of economy we have was disproved at the same time that the computer was invented. And then we confirmed that computers really worked by building them and filling the world up with them and, you know, using them for doing everything. Uh, but they are inimical to democratic systems, markets, normal culture, having conversations with people at an absolutely fundamental level. Um, if computers exist, then voting doesn't make any sense. This hmm. is, and, and there's a guy named Kenneth Arrow that got the Nobel Prize in 1970 for proving that voting doesn't make any sense and cannot be made to make sense. That is so interesting and well-timed for the, uh, you know, the year that we're sitting in right now. And it's also great to bring the podcast right back. I normally, my podcasts are usually a lot shorter, but the thing is, is Ben, we were just chatting and I could talk. We haven't even hit patents yet. And, uh, and, and, and so it's, it's been great to start off with talking about the importance of math and the importance of supporting the different ways that people learn math, because then you can turn into somebody like yourself, Noah, who's got so much knowledge and, and has, has really dedicated your life to the craft of math through the different applications of it and to just close off right at the very end and say that really at the heart of it is math. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's, that's the, the kind of big outgrowth of the 20th century. The computational math is the mathematics of imagination. And so everything you imagine is actually a mathematical proof. I love it. I love it. So thank you so much, Noah, for joining us today. It's been an absolute pleasure. And as I said to you before, I could talk to you for hours and, you know, today proves it. And uh, I definitely want to have you back on the show to talk about patents because that was one of the things that we definitely wanted to hit. So I'd love to have you back. And, uh, and thank you so much for being here, my man. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm happy to come back and, and get on to topic. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. And anybody who wants to reach out to him, it's Noah Healy. He's on LinkedIn, easy to find. He's got the uh, the bomb, B-O-M-B-E, uh, behind his picture with him with the red shirt. So it's easy to locate him and have a great conversation. Have him on your podcast because he's just got so much to talk about. Man, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you for being here. And with that, guys, this is the money. This is the mindset. This is the mentoring podcast. We will see you on the next one.